Welcome back everybody. So today we're going to talk about the scientific method, which is the method that biologists use to study our world of wildlife. Now, the scientific method may sound complicated, but it's really not. All it means is that we have a question that we asked, and we're going to try and find evidence or clues about whether our guess is right to help us make a decision about what's going on. So if you remember from last time, we had a question about why this one coral reef in our area was unhealthy and covered in algae. Now today, we're gonna to work with marine biologists, Trisha and Ed, to try and answer that question. Now Ed, if I remember right, you had a question, you had a hypothesis about what might be going on and happening in our system. That's right, Amy. And I hypothesize that in the area that is unhealthy, where we see a lot more algae, we'll see far fewer herbivorous fish, compared to the area that was healthy, where we'll see an awful lot more herbivorous fish. So our scientists, Trisha and Ed, think that the reason for the difference could be because there are fewer herbivorous fish to eat all the algae in the unhealthy area, in area number one. Without these fish, the algae can grow out of control and block out the sun to the coral growing below. The algae keep growing and the coral become sick and eventually die, which makes the coral reef ecosystem very unhealthy. This is bad news not just for people, but for the other plants and animals that live on the coral reef. Coral reef habitat is home to thousands of different marine plants and animals, both big and small. Now we need to go about deciding the best way to gather evidence to evaluate the hypothesis we just made. Uh, I think Trisha and Ed have some ideas about how we can do this. Yes, we do, Amy. So we're gonna go out to our two different reefs, our healthy reef and our unhealthy reef. And we're gonna collect some important information and data on both of those reef systems. The first area, area number one, is the one that looks unhealthy. And the second area, area number two, is the one we think is doing well and is healthy. This way, we can see what the differences are between the two areas. We will collect the same type of data or information in the two different areas. That way, we can compare the two areas equally. Okay, so what differences do we look for? And what kind of information should we collect? And how should we collect it? Well, the first thing is we have to check to see if there is actually a difference in coral reef health. Okay. Right now, we only think there might be a difference, but really, we have to go out and measure in order to be sure. To do that, we will look at how much of the coral reef in each area is covered in algae and compare the two. Here's an example of what we might find. In this first example, we can see lots of algae covering the coral. And in this second example, we can see lots of healthy coral with only some algae here and there. If we think there aren't many herbivorous fish, like the rabbit fish in the unhealthy area, and that's what causes the algae to grow out of control, then we should count how many fish are in each area and see what the difference is. Now remember, coral rely on other resources to live and grow too. Things like sunlight, clean, unpolluted water, and just the right water temperature. And there could be differences in these other resources that could cause a coral reef to become unhealthy also. So to rule those out, we'll measure two other things. First, we'll measure water temperature in each area and compare. Then we will see if there's a difference in the amount of pollution between the two areas. If those resources are the same in both the healthy and the unhealthy area, then that's a clue that water temperature and pollution are not causing area number one to be unhealthy. Now we're gonna head out into each study area and we're gonna collect the exact same information in the exact same way. We'll start with collecting information about algae, how much algae is covering each coral reef, and then we'll count how many fish are in each study area. And finally, we'll look at things like water temperature and distance to the nearest pollution source. So to collect our data in our two different areas, we're going to go out wearing our snorkel gear. And Amy is modeling our snorkeling gear. <laughs> That's right. So the first thing that Amy has is her wetsuit. This is going to keep Amy nice and warm in the water. The next thing, and this is the most important thing, is the mask and the snorkel. The mask helps Amy see under the water, and the snorkel helps Amy breathe in the water. Finally, the last piece of equipment that we have are our fins. The fins are going to help Amy swim as fast as a fish. That's right. And we also have a few other pieces of equipment that we're gonna take with us in order to make our measurements. 
So what Trish is holding here is called a quadrat, and it's actually just a simple square that we're gonna use to measure how much algae is covering each coral reef. To see how much algae is in each area, Trisha, Ed, and their science crew will lay down their sample squares, or their quadrats, and in each spot, they'll take a picture of what they see. Later in the lab, they'll be able to look at the picture of the quadrat to determine what percentage of the square contained algae versus healthy coral. They're using this square to measure one small section because the coral reefs we're trying to measure are really big and we simply can't count everything. It would take forever. So as scientists, we just count some of it. That's called taking a sample. And we don't want to take just one sample at each spot. We're actually going to take a couple samples in each location. This just means that instead of going out and using our quadrat to measure algae once, we do it five times in each area. Do you have any ideas why scientists take many samples instead of just one? We'll also count fish at each spot we lay down our quadrat. To do that, Trisha, Ed, and their science crew will use a simple video camera on a stick, just like this one. Right next to where they laid down each quadrat square, they'll swim in a straight line for two minutes using a video camera to film. They do the same thing five times in area one and five times in area two. Then they'll take the video back to the lab and count how many fish they found in each area. While we're out there, we'll also measure our other resources at each sample spot. So we'll measure water temperature using a thermometer just like this one. And then we'll also measure distance to the nearest source of pollution. But to figure out how close the nearest source of pollution is to each area, we simply look at a map. We find the closest source of pollution, and then we measure the distance between the pollution source and our two areas. Now here's a quadrat square laid down in area one. Well, we haven't made our official measurement yet, but it sure looks like there's a lot of algae in this square. Our quadrat square in area two, on the other hand, looks pretty different. There's a lot less algae in this area. But we're not done yet. Just because it looks different doesn't mean it is different. To be sure, we actually have to go out and count. So we'll look at the number of fish in each area and how much of our sample quadrat was covered in algae. That will provide evidence or clues about whether we made a good guess or a good hypothesis. 